Okay, hello everybody. And uh, please let me start this talk with a question. Who of you ever started a project from scratch? Yeah? Nice. So, you know, it's a beautiful feeling. At the first day, it looks like this. You have this green field and you feel you have all the possibilities out there. And then, after some weeks, it looks like this. It is cute and does exactly what it is supposed to do. But then, after some years, it looks like this here. And no, this is not me at college. This is the Frankenstein monster. I suppose you know him. This monster that has been assembled of different body parts of different dead people. And this is exactly what happens to software. You are integrating one use case after the other one, you are integrating one technology after the other one, and you are ending up with a non-testable, non-predictable Frankenstein monster. In this talk, I will show you three approaches of how to avoid this Frankenstein using Angular. The first approach is about NBM packages. The second one is about the monorepo. And the third one is about micro apps, the answer to microservices in the front end. And of course, after this, I won't leave you alone. After this, I will show you how to choose wisely a solution that fits to your needs. But first of all, let me introduce myself. I am Manfred. I'm a trainer and consultant for Angular, and I'm really focusing on this topic. I'm part of the Google Developer Expert team, and I'm also a Google uh, Trusted Collaborator for Angular. That means I'm helping the Angular team to create new features, especially currently for the next CLI version. I'm from Austria, especially from Graz. I'm doing a lot of things in Germany too. Sometimes I'm allowed to enter other countries in Europe, and my current product is also about Angular. It's a training for Angular in the enterprise. It shows you all the things you need to know when you are building enterprise scale applications with Angular. We are doing it as a public workshop in Vienna, for instance, but also as in-house workshops. Okay, so let's get started with the first topic. Let's get started with NBM packages. The idea here is quite simple. The idea here is to subdivide a big application into several tiny parts, into several tiny NBM packages that can be integrated to a common thing afterwards. And here the good message is that the CLI, beginning with version 6, allows you to do this. Beginning with version 6, it is capable of creating libraries. And this is really easy. You just need to new up a new application. And after that, you can move into this application and create a library. This is what's new. You can ng generate a new library. And this library will be a sub-project of your overall Angular solution. Here I'm creating a flight booking library. Then you can also create an application, for instance, this playground application that helps you to test your library. When you have done that and when you think, okay, now everything is in place, you can serve your playground application, just use ng-surf and point to the project in question. And after that, you can build your library. That is creating everything you need to publish to NBM in a way so that it works together with Angular seamlessly. It makes sure that it works together with tree shaking in Angular or also with ahead of time compilation. After this, you go to the distribution folder and then you can NBM publish everything by pointing to your registry in question. Perhaps it is a public registry, perhaps it is an in-house registry you are using for your projects. And this subdividing brings a lot of advantages. One advantage is distribution. You can easily distribute your source code amongst your colleagues. Another advantage is it gives you versioning. Every time you create a new version of your uh, library, you have to assign a new version number. And that means the consumer can decide upon whether to go with the newest version or with the older one that is more compatible with their software products. 
those are the advantages, but there are also some disadvantages when it comes to NPM packages, and they can be seen on the next slide. They can be seen here. So it turns out that all those advantages are also disadvantages at the same time. Why is this the case? Well, let me elaborate on this. When it comes to distribution, this is a disadvantage because it is somehow annoying to play this game within a project. Just think about what that means. First of all, you have to write a library, then you have to assign a version number, and then you have to npm publish it. And then you are switching roles. You are wearing the hat of the application developer. You are NPM installing the library. You are integrating the library into the application. And then, of course, you will find the bug. And so you have to switch roles once again. You have to wear the hat of the library developer. You have to fix the bug. You have to assign a new version number. You have to publish, NPM publish the new version. And this goes on and on and on, and somehow this is, of course, very annoying, and it does not help you with your physical health, of course. On the other side, when it comes to versioning, this is also annoying, because versioning means you can have old versions out there. And old versions means you can have version conflicts. And somehow we want to force everyone within our project to use the latest versions. This is not especially true when it comes to other projects. Other teams shall use the versions they want, but your project team should use one common version, uh, for instance, the newest one. And that means we need something better than NPM packages. And this better solution is the second approach I want to talk about. It's the monorepo approach. The monorepo approach tries to compensate all the disadvantages of packages and it tries to also use the advantages of them. What you see here is a monorepository. It is just a big folder that contains a lot of sub-projects. All the sub-projects your application consists of. And perhaps you are saying, hey, this is exactly what Manfred told us before. It is a folder that contains a library and a playground application. And do you know what? On a technical area, this is exactly what you have seen before. On an organizatorical basis, it is something completely different. Because when it comes to software organization, it is not about just a library and testing code anymore. It's about your whole software system. Every part of it goes into this folder structure, and that means all the libraries it consists of are co-located. One of the best things of this monorepository is this node modules folder here. Not that it exists, but that it exists just once. You have just one node modules folder with dependencies, and this means that all your sub-projects are sharing the same dependencies. All of them are using the same version of Angular, the same version of RxJS, the same version of Bootstrap. Just imagine what would happen if you used Angular 5 here and Angular 7 there. And then think about using those libraries together. I guarantee you, all hell would break loose. And so it's a good idea to force everyone into using the same dependencies. This brings a lot of advantages. One advantage is that everyone has to use the latest versions because the latest versions of the other libraries are co-located with your own code. They can be found under dot dot slash dot dot slash library name. There are no version conflicts because everyone is using the same dependencies. There is no burden with distributing libraries because you can just check in your folders into source control, and that means all your colleagues will get exactly the same libraries in the newest versions. And creating a new library is really a piece of cake. It is about adding a new folder in your existing structure. So this is really simple. And also, there is a lot of experience out there with this style of programming. 
For instance, this style of programming is very heavily used at Google or also at Facebook. And also Microsoft developers, .NET developers are using this style for about two decades. Who is using .NET? Yeah, some of you. Okay, I'm not looking who is using .NET. Okay, uh, some more. <laughs> no. Uh, when you're using .NET, you have this notation of a Visual Studio solution. And the Visual Studio solution is nothing else than a mono repository. It consists of a lot of projects belonging together. Or uh, perhaps you have used Eclipse before. In Eclipse, you have workspaces, which is also a way to group several projects belonging together. One of the best things about mono repositories is that it is not a one-way street. You can move back and forth. So let's imagine you have this beautiful mono repository and it consists of this validation library. It does everything you need and it does also everything other teams need. In this case, you could take this library and put it on an NBM registry to share it with other teams. And so you have the best of both worlds. You can develop everything within your mono repository. You don't have the burden of distributing things. You don't have version issues. And when you are done, you can publish everything for the other teams using NBM. This is exactly how Angular itself is written. Angular itself is written within a mono repository. And that makes sure that Angular core in the version 7 works together with Angular forms in the version 7, which works together with Angular router in the version 7. Everything is developed together, and when they are done, they are publishing it for the rest of us using NBM. So if you say now, hey, this is a wonderful idea, I love mono repositories, I want to encourage you to look into NX. NX is an extension for the Angular CLI, or as I call it, it is the sugar dip on top of the Angular CLI. It enhances the Angular CLI with a lot of new features, and some of them help you with creating mono repos. Just let me show you one of them. A very nice feature here is to visualize your library structure. It allows you to visualize which library is accessing which other library. And this is vital when it comes to big enterprise software. Because when it comes to big enterprise software, you want to avoid that each and every part of the software is communicating with each and every other part. This leads to a high coupling and this leads to a state where you cannot easily change something because each and every change would affect each and every part of the system. So I think here in this little example I'm good, but in a bigger example, if everything would access everything else, it would be a bad architecture. NX also allows you to define, to define limitations, limitations and restrictions regarding which part of the application is allowed to access which other part, and you can automatically test against it. There are linting rules for this. For instance, a linting rule that is preventing the local library to access the flight API in this very case. So we seem to have quite a perfect solution now. We've managed to subdivide a big application into tinier parts, and we don't have the burden of distributing libraries or version conflicts. Those are the advantages, but one more time, there are also disadvantages, and they can be found on the next slide. They can be found here. So it turns out that everything that is an advantage, it's also a disadvantage, because normally those sub-projects are talking to each other. They are accessing each other. And every time one library is accessing another library, you have a contract. And contracts are not easy to change. If you don't believe me, try to change your renting contract in the next break or your marriage contract. You will see it is not easy at all. You have to discuss, you have to find new solutions, and then you have to establish an intermediate solution in order to get there where you want to be. 
So it is everything but easy. It contains a lot of coordination. It contains a lot of coordination, especially if there are several teams involved, several programming teams, front-end teams, as you want to call them, because this calls for a lot of meetings, and this means you have to talk to them. To talk to them, e, no, just kidding around, nothing against communication, this is vital, but if you can avoid a huge amount of coordination, you will be more agile for sure. And this might be an advantage, of course. So because of this structure, you will also decrease maintainability, because you cannot easily change something. And this structure means you just have one architecture and one framework. Of course, you can try to squeeze in other frameworks. You can try to squeeze in other architectural styles. But when you do so, you will end up with a Frankenstein monster. And this is exactly what you want to prevent. This leads me to the third approach I want to tell you about today. This approach is called microapps. And the idea of microapps is really tempting and simple. It says that you shall not try to build a huge system that can do everything. Instead of this, you try to build several tiny systems that are capable of doing one thing, that are an expert for one specific kind of use cases. This the idea is quite old. It has been around for about two decades. It was very well described with domain-driven design. And some years ago, people in the back end just rediscovered it, and they called it microservices. I think nowadays, everyone is talking about microservices. If you take this very idea, and when you put it into the front end, you can call it micro front ends or even micro apps. Very simple, self-contained applications that are specialized into one thing. And this brings a lot of advantages. You don't have contracts between applications when it is a perfect fit, because the applications are self-contained. They can work on their own. You have a separate development and a separate deployment. When you are done, just put it in this, on, on the server and the user can use your new development immediately. You don't have the burden of using just one technology. You can mix and match technologies. You can use an own technology stack for all those applications. You can use Angular for this application. You can use AngularJS for that application. You can use VanillaJS for another application. Are there other frameworks? I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> and you can mix and match architectures. Each of those micro apps can have its very own architectural styles. Just use what is most suitable for the current needs you have within that micro app. So you see a lot of advantages. Another thing you have to think about when it comes to micro app is UI composition. UI composition means that you have to present the whole system as a common thing to the user. The user is not happy about the need uh, to start 50 applications every morning. We are happy about this because it decreases the complexity. The user is not. And so you have to find a way to integrate everything into a big common thing. And one very approach for this is using hyperlinks. In this case, you have several self-contained single page applications, and they are linked to each other using just hyperlinks. Hyperlinks is quite a major technology, if you ask me. They have been around for 30 years. And to be honest, I have never ever heard someone to say a bad word about hyperlinks. So they really seem to work. And even though that seems to be somehow awkward, this approach works very well for a specific kind of application. I would call this kind of application product suite. When it comes to a product suite like the Google suite, this works very well. Just think about Google Maps. Google Map can be considered a micro app. 
It deals just with one kind of use cases. It deals with working with maps and routes. And if you want to use another product of the Google Suite, you will just follow a hyperlink here on the right side. And so you will land within Google Docs or Google Sheets or Google Forms. By the way, the most important fact of this whole presentation can also be seen on that slide. If you don't remember anything, please always remember this very fact. I'm putting a lot of emphasis into it. Namely, there is a city called Steierberg. I really like it. It is in Lower Saxony in Germany, in Niedersachsen, Lower Saxony, and there is my name in it. It's even written in the right way. Is someone here from Lower Saxony? No one? Is someone here from Germany? Yeah, I love you people. You are great. Thank you. Thank you. This is the best thing of the whole presentation. So now let's go on with the boring technical stuff. When it comes to this approach, then you see you have a very simple approach, but it also has some downsides. You are losing state. When you are transitioning over from one application to the other one, you are used losing all the state because you are loading a completely new application. And you have to download this application. This is exactly what we wanted to prevent when we invented single page applications. The need for both packs, the need for loading new stuff from the server. Also, in general, you will make sure that you have a consistent look and feel. For instance, perhaps you want to make sure that this uh, widget looks the same in all your micro apps. And this is something where web components can help. Web components are framework independent components that allows you to write a widget once and to reuse it with each and every application regardless of the technology that is used. You can use it together with AngularJS and Angular, you know. So sometimes your user deserves something better than just a bunch of hyperlinks. And in these situations, you will try to write a shell. A shell that is capable of loading other applications on demand. That means you have a big single page application that loads tiny single page applications when needed. And when you think about how to write a web application that is capable of other web applications, perhaps you will immediately think about iframes. So I don't know about you, but I'm always getting this strange feeling in the stomach when I'm hearing the word iframe. No, just kidding. For sure, iframes are not the most popular element among web designers, but they have some real advantages. For instance, they provide a good amount of isolation. You cannot have a better isolation than with iframes. Isolation here means that the application in the first iframe cannot mess with applications in other iframes. A bug here does not influence the application there. A destroyed CSS file here does not influence the layout there, and they cannot hack each other, which is especially important when you want to integrate different applications from different vendors using something like a plugin system. Of course, they have a lot of disadvantages, and to compensate them, you can try to bootstrap several single page applications at once. That means you have one index HTML, and in this one index HTML, you load several single page applications when needed. In both cases, I would consider lazy loading. Just load everything on demand, don't load everything at once. And for this style, I have prepared a simple demonstration. Let me have a look at this. So here we see, do you see it? No. But here you see my Angular example application, and it looks like an ordinary Angular application at first sight. But the truth is, it is just a shell. When you click here, you get a whole self-contained Angular application loaded into the working area of this one. I'm calling it my blue Angular client. 
And when I'm clicking here, I'm getting my red Angular client loaded into the working area. Those Angular clients are self-contained applications. They also run in standalone mode. That means you can test them individually, you can develop them individually, you can deploy them individually. And when they are deployed, the shell is just grabbing the newest version and it is displaying it. So here I'm using another technology as I'm an Angular guy. I don't know this technology at all, I promise you. But in my point of view, this really shows that we can mix and match different technologies. And we can even wrap legacy code like AngularJS code and load it into our single page application. This is here what I'm calling the macro architecture. It holds all my micro apps together. In addition to that, I'm also having a micro architecture which is about this here, which is about reusing widgets within your micro apps. So normally you need both. You need to have a glue between your micro apps and then you need to do something like UI composition to bridge the gaps between your micro apps. For this here, I'm using web components, for instance. Okay, so this brings also a lot of advantages for sure. One advantage is you have several small and decoupled projects. Another advantage is you can work with autarkic teams. They can work on their own. They have a self-contained application which allows for a separate development as well as a separate deployment. Plus, they can have their own decisions technology-wise or architectural-wise. Those are the advantages, and one more time, there are several disadvantages. You can find them on the next slide. You can find them here. So one more time, it turns out that all those advantages are disadvantages at the same time, because all those advantages means you have more bundles. Each micro app comes with their own bundles, and that means they are less optimized. Perhaps you have duplicated code. You have Angular in this application and in that application, so you need, it, you need to load it twice. And you also have to make sure that your UI is consistent in some way, for instance, by using web components. So as we have advantages and disadvantages all the way, it is really difficult to choose the right solution for your needs. And to be honest, this is always a very difficult discussion when I'm doing this discussion with my customers. Most of the time, we are turn up running in cycles. And to break those cycles, I came up with an idea. I came up with a decision tree that helps us to identify a fitting solution. Of course, this decision tree is not the last word on this, but it already several times uh, proved to be in handy. The first question I would ask you here is, do you have a lot of shared state? Do the user need to navigate a lot between the applications? And when you say no, I don't have a lot of shared state, the user does not need to navigate a lot between the applications, then try to use hyperlinks. In this case, chances are high that you have a product suite with a lot of self-contained products and just start with hyperlinks. You can easily switch to other solutions after that. If you say, hey, there is a lot of shared state, and if you say, hey, the user needs to move back and forth all the time, then the next question is, do you have to integrate legacy code, server-side rendered applications, or do you need a very strong isolation? When you need this, then try iframes. Of course, you will not win an architectural award using iframes, and it is not the best fit for public websites. You will not write the next Amazon using iframes, but when it comes to integration in an intranet scenario, this is fitting. And this is what software architecture is about. It is about finding a fitting solution. 
when you say no, we don't have legacy, I mean, who has legacy? <laughs> and if you say we don't need this strong isolation, then the next question is, do you even need a separate deployment? Do you even need a mix of technologies? And when you say, yes, I need this, because my software needs to evolve in long term over 10 or 20 years, and because you say I cannot predict the future, then try to bootstrap several single page applications. One index HTML, several single page applications. If you say no, this is not the case, we are working on this product and after three years it's done, then go with a mono repo style. In this case, the mono repo is probably the best solution. Of course, I'm a very nosy person. When you think about your current product, uh, projects, or products, who would say using hyperlinks is the best approach? Okay, no one. Who would say using iframes is the best approach for you? I'm not looking, who would say it? Okay, who would say bootstrapping several single page applications is the best approach? Okay, who would say the mono repo is the best approach? And who doesn't care at all? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> nice, <laughs> great. So if you like this talk, perhaps you will also like my blog. I've written a lot about those topics because this is currently one of my main topics. I'm discussing this with a lot of customers. And if you say, hey, this was an awful talk, check out my blog anyway. Perhaps I'm writing better than I'm speaking, who knows? <laughs> so let me come to a conclusion. We have seen that NPM packages can be used for reusing code. And we have seen that the mono repo allows you to substructure a big application into tinier parts. We've also seen that micro apps are uh, for decoupling, for decoupling between technologies, for decoupling between projects, but also for decoupling between teams. You have autarkic teams that can work on their own. When it comes to writing packages, you can use the CLI, beginning with version 6. When it comes to mono repos, you can also use the CLI, but I would to encourage you to use mono repos. And when it comes to micro apps, then try hyperlinks, iframes, or to bootstrap several single page applications. And one last thing, please try to avoid this guy here, he isn't a nice guy at all. Please try to avoid the Frankenstein monster in your next project. So what you find here are my coordinates. You will find all my slides and examples in my blog. You will also find all the information about my training regarding Angular. And if you want, please follow me on Twitter so that we can stay in contact. Thanks for coming and have a nice day.